Good afternoon and welcome everybody to uh, MOS Live today. Today we're talking with Museum of Science Education about citizen science and how you can get involved. My name is Katie, my pronouns are she, hers, and I'll be keeping an eye out for all of your questions during this webinar today. If you're watching on Facebook, please know that to ask questions, you'll have to click the Zoom link in the caption of this video. On Zoom, just press the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So at this point, I'd like to invite our presenter to introduce themselves and we'll get started. Thanks, Katie. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah. Um, I am an educator at the museum and my pronouns are she and hers. And I'm going to talk to you today all about citizen science. So this is going to be more a webinar about what we're doing here at the Museum of Science, some things that you guys can do at home, and feel free to ask questions like Katie said in the Q&A uh, bar. Uh, but first, I'm gonna launch this poll because I wanna understand a little bit more about why you are all here attending this webinar today. So if you're on Zoom, it should pop up on your screen and feel free to vote about a reason why you're attending this webinar today so I can try to um, tailor some of the things I say about why you're here. So I'll just leave this up for a little bit and I will let all of you vote. Looks like we have about 60% of the people already voted. Awesome, so this looks great. I'll wait one more second. All right. Let me show you the results. Looks like most people are here to learn all about citizen science, which is amazing. Um, and to learn a little bit how to use citizen science apps. So I'm gonna go into depth on how to use one of the apps, but feel free to ask questions at the end or during if you have any more questions about um, citizen science and using the app. Okay, so let's get started. So what is citizen science? Um, so this month is citizen science month, April, 2020, and it's a month dedicated to learning all about what citizen science is and learning about um, different things that you can do and be involved in citizen science. So what is citizen science? Citizen science is collaborative research done by everyday people anytime, anywhere to help answer questions that scientists can't answer alone. So basically what that means is that it's taking community members together to do science, to learn about science, to answer some sort of question. It can be a specific question, but a lot of times it's more of a, a broad question or a broad thing about science that we just need a lot of data for. So today I'm going to be talking to you about climate science and about um, more biodiversity. So these two apps that I'll be talking about are more of a general idea of citizen science versus answering a specific question, but from that, scientists can then pull that data and then start answering questions um, that maybe they didn't even know existed to begin with. So it's really just about helping scientists collect data and also being involved in science yourself and learning yourself. Um, so who can participate? Uh, anyone can participate in citizen science. So you can, um, participate online, outside, in your house, as an individual, as part of a family, as part of a group. Um, today, I'm mainly going to be talking about um, projects that are online or um, in your house slash outside, because I really wanna make sure that we're doing um, individual projects that are following our social distancing guidelines. Um, I wanna make sure that we are being safe and being smart, but still being able to contribute to scientific research and to science. Um, so anyone can participate. You can participate as your family, as um, an individual. You can participate if you are a kid as well. And I'll talk a little bit more on how to safely participate as um, someone who's under 12 when it comes to these online projects. So SciStarter is a really, really great place to either start or if you know a lot about citizen science to go to. So SciStarter.org, it is a website 
um, that hosts thousands of citizen science projects. So you can see here on the screen that it says find a project. You can search by keyword about anything that you're interested in. So as I mentioned today, I'm going to be talking more about uh, climate citizen science projects, but they are really anything. You can see here in the keyword, for examples, it says weather or dog. This guy here is taking some water samples. There are citizen science projects about Alzheimer's research, about cats, about um, fish counting, really anything you can think of, there's probably a project for it. So after this, or right now, whatever you want, go to SciCenter.org and you can start searching for some projects that you can participate in. And it's free to create um, a username and log in. You just um, sign up for it and it's completely free. And at this top, you see everything that they offer. So they have a bunch of projects. They have a list of tools. The projects I'm going to be talking about today, you don't need any tools. Um, but if you are doing, for example, you really like water sampling, there's going to be some ideas on where to get a water sampling kit and things like that. Uh, events like this one right now and a blog and podcast. So it's a really great place to just start to learn about citizen science and to find a project that fits you. Um, so what are we doing at the Museum of Science? So we are, we have a project uh, with SciCider and a lot of other partners uh, funded by NOAA, which is the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association. And it's called Citizen Science, Civics, and Resilient Communities. Um, that's a really long name. You don't need to remember that. Um, <laughs> what it is, it's essentially connecting citizen science projects to climate hazards. So um, the climate hazards that we were really focused on were extreme heat and sea level rise. So we wanted to find awesome citizen science projects that connected to those to not only gather data about um, extreme heat, for example, but to get citizen science and community members involved with learning about extreme heat and collecting data about it. And hopefully also um, having some sort of civic change. So making sure our data goes toward um, some sort of policy change. So I'm going to use the example of extreme heat and what we did last summer uh, to involve citizen scientists into our project. Um, so our project was called Wicked Hot Boston. Um, it was a project that we did last year um, uh, in 2019. And it was all about connecting citizen science project to the hazard of extreme heat. So in order to do this, um, we implemented a project about mapping the urban heat island. So the urban heat island effect is when cities are a lot hotter than the surrounding area. And before city planners in Boston, Cambridge and Brookline were using um, these heat maps that were generated from satellite pictures and giving surface temperatures. So the temperature of a sidewalk or a driveway or the concrete. And those maps basically show that the entire greater Boston region was really hot, upwards of 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And although it's helpful to know that Boston is hotter, city planners really wanted to know where in Boston, where in Cambridge, where in Brookline is it the hottest? Because when you're talking about city planning, you really need to do it more on the neighborhood level. Where are you going to start? Where can we plant those trees? Where can we implement our policies where it's going to matter the most? So to do that, we used these sensors that you can see here on the screen. Um, these are heat sensors. They were developed by Kappa Strategies, uh, Science Museum of Virginia and Portland State University. And in these heat sensors, they have, they have a heat, a temperature sensor, a humidity sensor, and a GPS. And what it does is it collects data about the actual air temperature around you. So it's the temperature that you feel, that you breathe in, that you experience during a heat wave. Um, so in order to get the data that we needed, we needed to have 10 of these sensors attached to cars and drive them around Boston, Cambridge, and Brookline. So we needed at least 10 people to drive. We needed 10 people to help the driver navigate because if you ever driven through Boston, it's 
not that fun. Um, and we only were a team of five at the time. So in order to do this and collect this data, it was really important to have citizen scientists help us with this because they're the people that live in Boston, that live in Cambridge, they know the roads, they know their neighborhoods, and now they contributed to creating this data and this map that you see um, that city planners are going to use to make a difference in their own communities. So we actually ended up getting over 50 citizen scientists to help us collect this data. And that was just so powerful because they were the ones who lived there and they now created a map that can be used by city planners to make a difference in their own communities. And this was, um, shown by how much the media really appreciated this work and really loved it. Um, so here is a story from IC Change. Um, NBC 10 Boston picked it up twice, which is really cool. And here's a um, article from climate.gov from NOAA. So it just really shows that community input and community um, data is really important and it's gonna drive um, policy for the future. It's already, this map has already been shown in the Climate Ready Boston report, and it will be used in future things when it comes to planning for extreme heat. So that's one example of something that the Museum of Science did last summer, but now I want to jump into more what you guys can do right now. Um, so how can you be involved in citizen science? So on top of the urban heat island mapping that we did last summer, we also had this project called IC Change. And this is a citizen science um, platform that is all about documenting and learning from the changing environment. So as I was mentioning heat, those were great maps, right? That shows you how hot certain areas are, certain neighborhoods are, but when it comes to weather and especially heat, it's more about how you feel, how you're reacting to that. And so IC Change gives you the opportunity to do that. It allows you to um, show your voice and also have um, more hard data to back that up. So for when you're posting to IC Change, it's kind of like, we like to call it uh, Instagram for climate change in a way. You're basically posting a picture or posting a comment about how you're feeling about the weather that day or what you're seeing. And what's really important about this app is that, as I mentioned, you live in your house, in your apartment. You look at the weather outside every single day. You know best what's happening um, when it comes to weather and climate. And so this is just a way that you can document that and have it all in one place so that your data is there to use. Um, and each post is actually synced with weather and climate data. So here are some examples of posts that are from IC Change. Um, so you can see you can post about any sort of weather. Um, here you can see um, it says investigating. So there are these, these things called investigations, which basically just um, you put your post into a little bucket. So if you're posting about extreme heat, you'll investigate about extreme heat. If you are posting about um, snow, then you'll post into something about snow. And that's just so that all of the weather posts of the same weather are kind of all together and you can search. Um, another really cool thing about IC Change and something that when you're signing up for, make sure that you put your location services on because it's really important to show where you are. Uh, this is a worldwide app, so it's really awesome to see what's happening around the world, but it's more often to see what's happening in your own community. So it's a way that you can have a community conversation meet people that are around you and have that dialogue and conversation about things that are happening in your own neighborhoods. Um, when you make a post, it may look like it's very specific, but your, loca your specific location will never be shared. So as you see on these um, public posts, it says just Brookline, Mass. So it's just gonna give you the town that you're in. They'll never share your specific uh, location data if you're worried about that. And also when you share your location, it's gonna grab from the nearest weather station. So this 
whether um, this temperature that you see was automatically grabbed. So you don't have to go find what the weather is, search it, look it up. It's going to automatically sync that for you. So you'll always have that on your post. And I mentioned briefly in the beginning that if you are um, a teacher or a parent with kids that are under 12, you um, need to be more careful when it comes to posting things on online platforms because this is in a way a social media platform and so you should treat it as you would any other platform. Um, so one thing that you can do as you see here is that a teacher of a middle school actually created an account for the entire middle school and the students can post to it but their names and um, are not exposed. So, so it's just a one shared account. So if you're a parent you can put it under your name or maybe the family name. Um, it doesn't have to be specific. So that's just one way that as a teacher, you can still have them be using these online platforms, but making sure that you're keeping the identity safe of the kids that you're working with. Um, and one awesome thing about IC Change, these are my posts and something that I discovered. I've now been using the app for over a year. So now I'm starting to see what I was posting last year. And this is so cool to me because even in in my head, I knew it was, I felt like last year was colder, but I didn't really have any evidence for that. I didn't really know. Um, and now I can actually look back at my posts and not only look at pictures, but I can see how I was feeling. Um, so the post on the left is from 2019 and on the right is from 2020, both in January. Um, you can see that the temperatures were actually pretty similar, but there is one major difference. Um, last year, the, uh, the Charles River actually froze over and this year it never fully froze. So it was really cool for me to see that actual data in front of me that I took to show that how the river was freezing or wasn't freezing. And as I keep doing this, I can collect a huge data set about this and then that can be really useful to someone who's trying to study um, how warm or cold the winters are in Boston, or maybe very specific about the Charles. So I'm collecting this data, not only for me, but maybe for someone who could use it in the future. So to sign up for IC Change, um, it is a free platform. So you can sign up online. Uh, it's in the App Store or Google Play. Um, when you sign up, make sure you use the same email that you would use to sign up for that original SciStarter account. And that's because when you look at SciStarter, there's a dashboard and the dashboard will host all of your citizen science projects that you do. So it's basically just a nice little way that you can organize yourself and see um, everything that you're doing and contributing to. Um, Let's see, Katie, do you have any questions about IC change or anything before I move on to iNaturalist? No IC change or citizen science questions yet, Sarah. Thanks. Cool. Awesome. Um, well, don't forget you can ask them in the Q&A bar um, on Zoom. Okay, so the next project I'm going to talk about is iNaturalist. Um, this is a project that is all about biodiversity and nature. So it is an online social network. Um, it is an app or a website. You can do either or both. And the primary goal is to connect people to nature. But what's also really cool about this app is that it's generating all of this amazing biodiversity data from all over the world. So this is a worldwide app. And you basically just take pictures of biodiversity, whether it be trees or animals or birds or mammals or fungi, any sort of biodiversity. You take a picture of it and you share it to this platform. And it's really um, cool not only to discover nature for yourself, but also that data can then be used by scientists all over the world studying anything that they need this data for. Um, so how it works is you take a picture, you record your observation, you share it out to iNaturalist, and then you discuss your findings. And I'm going to talk about all of these steps as we move forward. So the first thing you need to do is make an iNaturalist account. Um, again, it is free. 
Make sure you're only posting your personal observations, so pictures that you took yourself versus other people. Um, it is important to share where you saw it. There are ways to um, kind of alter your location so it's a bigger area if you don't want it to be a very specific location. But when you're talking about wild biodiversity, it is important to say where you saw it since especially for plants or migratory animals, it might be really important when it comes to exactly where you saw it. Um, take a picture of what you saw and when you saw it. So a really cool thing about iNaturalist and I see change as well is you can just take pictures on an actual camera if you want or on your cell phone and then you can upload them later. So when you upload things later, you just need to make sure that you are changing your uh, location and date and time because a lot of times I know on my iPhone, it automatically inputs that info and it may not be correct. So just when you upload anything, make sure that you're doing the correct um, date, time, and location. And then post evidence of what you saw. So some sort of picture or sound. So iNaturalist is the platform that you use to uh, record biodiversity. And in order to, um, and something called a BioBlitz is where you have this brief intensive survey of biodiversity over a set area in time. So basically, it's a fun way to get people engaged with nature over this short four day period, but it eventually gets more and more people involved with doing this um, awesome work. So the City Nature Challenge is a way that um, people in cities were able to connect with nature over this four-day bio blitz. So it started in uh, 2016 between San Francisco and Los Angeles and they had this challenge to see who can record the most amount of posts, who can find the most biodiversity in their city, and who can observe and identify the most amount of species. It was so popular in 2017, 16 cities, including Boston, joined. Um, and then the next year, 2018, it became worldwide. Last year, there was over 160 cities that were a part of this. And then in this year, there's over 200 cities worldwide. Um, this year, it's gonna be a little bit different. It is not quite the city nature challenge. It is more the city nature celebration. Uh, so this year we are more celebrating the nature around us and we are making sure that we are observing biodiversity that is in our normal areas that we live. Um, so making sure we're staying to our house, our backyard, our neighborhoods, um, the sidewalks we normally walk, just making sure we're not going out of our way to observe biodiversity and we're keeping those social and physical distancing rules in mind and we are just really embracing the nature that's around us right now. Um, so this is just an awesome way to get out of your house or out of your apartment and search for the nature around you and you would be really surprised what's just directly around you. I went out on Saturday just for a half an hour and I took my phone and I took a ton of pictures and I found over 10 things within 20 minutes. And honestly, I just kind of looked at my backyard and I was like, oh, there's grass and trees. But I found, you know, a robin. I found a bunny. I found uh, a land snail. I didn't even know I had land snails behind my yard. Um, so it's just a really great way to get out there. Um, so this just explains more about the City Nature Challenge. It's just a great way to not only increase the amount of people observing, but just connect yourself to nature. And what's really awesome is that every year you see more and pe more people are starting to observe. So this is number of observations per week, and you can see the big um, increase during every City Nature Challenge. And that's really cool, but you can also see that after the City Nature Challenge, the number of observations per week are much higher as well. So it just gets people really involved with learning about nature. And um, it's great because these observations, like I said, are used by scientists who study these things every single day. So how does it work? Um, we are currently in this year's City Nature Challenge. So today is April 27th. 
and is the last day for observation. So after this, feel free to go out and take some pictures, observe plants, animals, fungi, anything you see and share it out. And then over the next four days is when we will doing, be doing the identification phase. So I'm gonna talk about these two phases um, and we will move forward from there. So this is the City Nature Challenge Boston area. So as I said, there are over 200 cities worldwide and so those cities have some boundaries. Um, this is our Boston area. It is between the 495 Belt, uh, the Cape, and the islands and Stellwagen Bank. So if you with, live within that geofence, then anything you post to iNaturalist will automatically be taken in toward the City Nature Challenge. You don't really have to do anything to make your posts count toward it. Those are just the posts they're counting. And unfortunately, I am not within that geofence, uh, but I am still posting because I'm still wanting to increase the amount of observations and just be part of it. So if you're not within this area, you can still participate and still post to iNaturalist. And like I said, this year is more of a celebration, so they won't name a winner this year. However, they still have some goals they want to reach. They still want to see if people are, you know, observing certain things and identifying um, certain animals. Um, at the bottom here, you can see all of the organizations that um, organized the City Nature Challenge. So these are all the partners for the Boston area. And we are really excited to be someone who's collaborating this year to getting the word out about this. So I'm gonna now talk about how you make an observation for uh, iNaturalist. So this are, these are screenshots from an iPhone. Um, you can upload things online as well. It's a little bit different and it's actually a little bit easier depending on how you look at it. I use my phone for the most part, but if you have a ton of pictures, you can download everything to your computer and kind of more like photo dump it into the online platform. I believe an Android looks a little bit different than this as well, but the steps are the same. Um, so what you do is you press observe at that bottom menu, and then you either take a picture right then using that green button, or you upload a picture from your camera roll. I found it easiest to go out and just take a bunch of pictures on my iPhone and then upload them later when I have Wi-Fi. Um, things just move faster and you can kind of sit there and put everything up at one time uh, versus doing it in the field, but it's up to you how you want to do it. So once you pick your picture, you press next. Um, you can keep adding pictures, so feel free to take multiple angles, especially if it's a plant. Um, make sure to get the petals, the stem, uh, the grass or wherever it is. Make sure to get all those angles. It really helps when it comes to identifying. Um, and then at the bottom here, you see that you change or have your date and location. So depending on, like I said, when you upload things later, it might automatically grab your date and location. Uh, make sure to change that so that it matches where you actually took that picture. And then you can view suggestions on what do you see. So there are a lot of options when it comes to this. Um, you can look up species by name. So if you absolutely know what it is, you can look it up and you can identify it right then and there. Um, or you can use this AI. So uh, iNaturalist has been uh, gathering data for years and they have this platform that's starting to help identify certain species. So here you can see that from this picture um, they said it's visually similar to a sea otter, it's also visually similar to a California sea lion. So if you know what it is you can click it and that will help you identify the animal. But if you don't know what it is it's actually better to you to even uh, either leave it blank or to look up just the general genus or the general order of what you think it may be. So for example, I know nothing about land plants. I just never really took land botany. Um, so whenever I'm observing trees, I usually leave it blank because I, even if it says it's visually similar, I have no idea if it actually is that, uh, that species. So you can leave it blank and I'll explain the identification part next. 
Um, but that's better, so you're not confusing the AI and you're not confusing people who are looking at it. But if you know what it is, then definitely identify it. Um, or you can just do a general, general um, order or genus. So for example, the land snail, I knew it was a land snail, but I had no idea the species. So I typed in, I looked up species by name, I looked up land snail, and it gave me an order and it allowed me to click the general order and then people will help me identify it down to the species level. So once you do that, you press share and then it's out into the iNaturalist community. Um, some tips and tricks when you're observing. Make sure it's a wild organism. This is actually really important. Um, they're super interested in what's wild. So not if the tree is planted by you or by someone else, not, um, things that are planted or animals like dogs or things that you have in your house. Um, make sure it's wild to the environment that you're in. Make sure you have one focal species. So if you're taking a bunch of pictures, making sure that you're focused in on one thing and then uploading different posts for different species. Uh, make sure your photo is clear and in focus. It's a lot easier now that camera phones on your cell phones are so much better. Um, and then, like I said, if you know it, name it. If you don't know it, then try to get it to some sort of level or just leave it blank. And you can leave it blank because there's the second part. This is called the identification part. And this is the part that's going to be happening over the next four days of the City Major Challenge. So here, this is kind of what it looks like when you upload an observation. Um, you have these suggested IDs. So people who are on iNaturalist can go and look at your posts and they can help you to identify um, what they see. So they can either agree with you, they can suggest a new ID, or if you left it blank, they can suggest an ID in general. And then the community can kind of go back and forth and discuss what they think that it is. And if more than two people agree, or two thirds of people agree, it becomes research grade. So basically what this means is that there is a consensus. The iNaturalist community believes that it is this species and a lot of people are agreeing about it. And it's important to get up to research grade because that's the data that the scientists will grab and use. So today, go out and observe, and then over the next four days, you can go help identify. So I mentioned I know nothing about land plants, so I leave those blank, but I know a lot about marine animals. So I can search marine animals that I know I can help identify on iNaturalist and go help out my iNaturalist community whilst other people are helping me identify the tree that I found. So you can help other people, other people help you, and it creates this community about learning about biodiversity. Um, for example, no one's identified my land snail yet, so I don't know what it is, um, but I also found a robin, and I knew that it was a robin, but then someone helped me say that, yes, it was this eastern robin. So it was really cool to see, and now I know, I look out my backyard and I know the exact genus and species of the animal that I helped to observe. So um, I talked a lot during this webinar. Uh, this is a place where you can go to learn about everything I talked about. Um, so scistarter.org slash noaa-museum of science. This is where you're gonna find everything that we are focusing on at Museum of Science. You can see at the top here, you can learn more about our extreme heat project. And then you can learn more about our sea level rise project. I didn't talk about it today, but we use an app called MyCoast and it's all about um, investigating coastal resilience and sea level rise and flooding. Um, so you can learn more about it here. You can learn how to use iNaturalist and IC Change and just learn more about citizen science in general. If you scroll down on the website, there are awesome videos about what citizen science is. Um, so Katie, are there any questions? Yes, uh, we have two. So we have a iNaturalist specific question. Can mm -hmm. you talk about ways that scientists use the observations people contribute through iNaturalist? Yes, so I am not an expert, um, but you can definitely look up, if you go to um, iNaturalist online or Zoo New England is actually who's hosting the Boston City Nature Challenge page, you can find more examples. Um, 
But I do know one example. I don't remember the specific species, um, but it was a species of bird. And so many people were starting to observe it at different times of the year in different places. And scientists who was looking at this data noticed that people were observing this bird in this area and they thought it was really weird. Um, so they started to collect the data over the years and what has been done in the past and actually discover that this spe the species of bird was migrating earlier than it was in the past. So through iNaturalist data, they were actually able to determine different migration patterns of one specific species. So that's just one example. There are hundreds. And um, it's just really cool that citizen collected data was then used to learn something new about a species. Um, yeah, I think you can find that just on the iNaturalist page, though it will lead you to a lot of the different uh, papers that have been published from the data. Um, and all of the research grade data goes straight into this, it's kind of like a nature encyclopedia where um, scientists can grab the data from. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question about other citizen science projects. Do you know of any that relate more to urban issues, noise levels, smog, et cetera? Um, I can't think of any at the top of my head. I do know that there is an air quality uh, project. You use an air quality sensor and you um, record what you find from your sensor. That project is on SciStarter, so you can look it up. Just search air quality. Um, it should pop up for you. Um, and yes, I know that there is a lot of other projects. Um, I know specifically in Boston, there are a lot of noise studies happening. So feel free to search for those projects. I know they exist. Um, so yeah, uh, there are a lot of urban projects. And I guess I didn't really mention on SciStarter, you can also uh, change your location to be very specific. So if you wanna find projects that are happening specifically in one area of Boston, you can search projects by location and then find those projects specifically. Thank you. Uh, and we have another question that I think will lead us to talking about SciStarter. Um, this person started a program called Middle Schoolers for Change. What other projects uh, or websites could be appropriate for middle school age? Hmm. Um, well, SciStarter is definitely a place to go um, when it comes to middle school projects. Um, hmm. I can't really think of anything. I oh. think through SciStarter, you can filter like different, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's ages or some kind of category. I think it's, yeah, either age or grade. You're right. You can filter it based on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that might be a really great tool to use. Filter it by the ages or the grades and it will pop up with fun projects. Um, Girl Scouts actually have a lot of citizen science projects. So if you search that, um, they're usually tailored around middle school age. You can find the projects that Girl Scouts do and see if that's any interest to you as well. Thank you. Um, we have one last question uh, that I think will will also help us say goodbye. Uh, where can folks watch this later so that they remember what to do? Uh, awesome. Um, so we are working on that right now. It is being broadcasted to Facebook right now. So it will live on the Museum of Science's Facebook page for right now. Uh, in the future, it will probably go up on our Museum of Science website, which we'll link you to at the end. And then it will probably also be posted to this SciCider page that is up as well. So hopefully it will be in a lot of places. For right now, you can find it in the Facebook video archives and it should live there. Um, but here is the link for the rest of our stuff. And I just want to thank you all for being, um, for coming to this webinar and participating. And it's been really fun. So I hope you learned something and uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, to repeat, to check out more programs, visit the website, mos.org slash mos at home, or follow us on social media. And as Sarah mentioned, you can find some of our older programs there as well.
If you enjoyed today's presentation, please visit www.mos.org slash science matters to support MOS at home. That's www.mos.org slash science matters. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.